What are we going to do? We're going to explore only the firstborn approximation. And the firstborn approximation corresponds to just taking this part. So this would be the first born approximation. It corresponds to what we were doing here. What did we do here? We were simplifying the second term, the integral term, by using what the Green's function looked like. We simplified this term. So all what we did here was valuable, except that there's one little difference. We, in that Born approximation, we replaced the psi that appears inside the integral by the incident psi, which is the psi in here. So we will do that now to simplify this uh, quantity in the so-called first Born approximation. When can we use it? So uh, very good. So when is the Born approximation a good approximation? Well, we are throwing away terms in general. When we're, when we're putting an expansion of this form, we're saying, OK, we can set the wave function equal to the free part plus the interacting part. So we have the free part, and it gave us this quantity. And the interacting part gave us the second one. So the Born approximation is good when sort of the free Hamiltonian dominates over the perturbation. So if you have a, a scattering center that has a finite energy bump and you're sending things with very high energy, the Born approximation should be very good. It's a high energy approximation in which you are basically saying that inside the integral, you can replace the plain incident wave because that dominates. That's not the whole solution. The whole solution then becomes a plain integral wave plus a scattered wave. But the plain wave dominates over the scattering process. So it should be valid in high energy. It's better and better. In high energy approximation. So we have it here, and let's uh, therefore clean it up. So if we call this equation equation A, we say back to A, the first born approximation, back to A, the first born approximation gives us psi of r equals e to the i k i r. Now we put all the indices, all the arrows, and we have here minus 1 over 4 pi integral d cube r prime e to the minus i k n dot r prime, u of r prime, and e to the i k i dot r prime. All this multiplied by e to the i k r over r. So let's put a few vectors here. That's it. OK, so it's basically this same thing here, but now replacing the incident wave here. That's the so-called firstborn approximation. But now this is really good. Oh. We can compare this with uh, what we usually called f theta of phi, the expression over brackets, is the scattering amplitude f theta phi. So here we have an answer. f at 
wave number k of theta and phi is equal to this integral. Let's write it out. Minus 1 over 4 pi integral d cubed r prime. And now we will combine the exponentials. Happily, the two exponentials depend on r prime. So it's a difference of exponents. And uh, we will call it e to the minus i capital K vector dot r prime u of r prime, where this capital K vector is equal, I kept the sign, Kn minus, this term would enter with a minus in that k, ki, or ks, the scattering k, minus the incident i vector. Remember, we defined there on that blackboard the scattered momentum as k times the direction of uh, observation, that unit vector. So in combining these two exponentials into a single one, we have this capital K vector that is a pretty important vector. And now, this is a nice formula. <laughs> it, it kind of tells you story that there are not many ways to generate things that are interesting. Um, here it says that fk, the scattering amplitude as a function of theta and phi, is nothing else than a Fourier transform of the potential evaluated at what we would call the transfer momentum. So it's, uh, the scattering amplitudes are doing Fourier transforms of the potential. Pretty nice, pretty pictorial way of thinking about it. Fourier transforms are functions. Uh, I think when people look at this formula, there's a little uneasiness because the angles don't show up on the right side. Uh, it's a theta and phi on the left, but I don't see a theta nor a phi on the right. So I think that has to be always clarified. So for that, if you want to use really theta and phi, I think most people will assume that k incident is indeed in the z direction. Z direction, so here is k incident. And it has some length. k scattered has the same length. It's made by the same wave number k without any index, but multiplied by the vector unit vector n, as opposed to k incident is the same k multiplied by the unit z vector. So the scattered vector is the vector in the direction that you're looking at. So this is ks is over here. And therefore, this vector is the one that has the phi and theta directions. That is that vector. And the vector k is k scattered minus k initial. So the vector k is the transfer vector, is the vector that takes you from k initial to ks, is the vector that must be added to k initial to give you the scattered vector. So this vector, capital vector K, it's a little cluttered here. Let me put the Z in here. That vector is over there. And uh, that vector uh, is a, are a complicated vector, not so easy to express in terms of Ki and Ks, because it has a component down, but it's uh, 
It has an angle of phi as well. But one thing you can say about this vector is its magnitude is easily calculable because there is a triangle here that we drew that has k uh, incident and ks, and here is k. So this has length k, this has length k, and this has length capital K, the triangle with angle theta. So if you drop a vertical line, you see that K is twice this little piece, which is uh, little k sine theta over 2. So that's one way that formula on the right-hand side has the information of theta. It also has the information of phi because you also need phi to determine the vector k. So this is an approximation, but look how powerful approximations are in general in physics. This approximation is an approximation for the scattering amplitude. It first, it's a very nice physical interpretation in terms of a Fourier transform of a potential. Second, it gives you answers even in the case where the potential is not spherically symmetric. You remember when potentials were spherically symmetric, the scattering amplitude didn't depend on phi, and we could use partial waves, and that's a nice way of solving things, but here, at the expense of not being exact, we have been able to calculate a scattering amplitude when the potential is not spherically symmetric. So you manage to go very far with approximations. You don't get exact things, but you can go into results that are a lot more powerful. So this is... Uh, an explanation of this um, formula, and we can use this formula. In fact, we'll do a little example, and these are the things that uh, you still have to do a bit in the homework as well. Many of them are in Griffiths, and uh, indeed, technically speaking, what you need to finish uh, for tomorrow uh, hinges a bit in what I'm saying, but the final formulas are well written in Griffiths explicitly, and in fact, half of the problems are solved there. So it shouldn't be um, so difficult.